All right, so my name is Sarah uh, Bartik. This is my email for some other contacts. So I'm here at this time for two days' visit for different kinds of activities and so on. So within this visit, I thought it would be a very good opportunity. So I suggested actually to organize this presentation about the Bitcoin. Kind of to say my motives for this presentation and uh, therefore the kind of the goals with this presentation are the following. Uh, number one, I'm sure everybody has heard about Bitcoin, but uh, I believe that not so many people know exactly how this works. Because the Bitcoin is to simplify a payment system between two people. But basically this kind of natural vision and uh, approach and perception in the way how the system is set up and the principles how it works are completely different. So therefore I believe that not so many people know all the details how the system works. So my first purpose here and the goal is to explain to you so that there is at least one group of people more that understand exactly how the system works, which is very useful. Uh, second, uh, what's really very interesting is actually that uh, uh, there are different payment systems today, like a bank or a credit card bill and so on. And these systems work, uh, accomplish their tasks in a kind of to call very natural way. I pay to you, you clear the transaction with the bank. But what's very interesting that uh, Bitcoin has a concept that accomplishes this payment between two of us in somehow kind of unnatural way, in a very special way with the special types of the concept and approach and protocol so it doesn't look like uh, so intuitive and natural and so therefore I would like also to bridge this gap between what is the perception in this conceptual sense and uh, how the system really works. Next there are some initial implementations and deployments so uh, I would like to inform you what they are and how they really work not uh, really what you have heard Another motive is I believe that actually most of information which are generally available are relatively negative because of this uh, use for money laundering and other things. I think uh, you will agree that we have so far transferred everything into digital world and internet starting 25 years ago from our email, then recently our photos and uh, documents and our life through Facebook, everything except money. <coughs> and I'm not talking about e-banking. I'm talking native virtual currencies. So whether, as everybody is saying, whether Bitcoin or some alternative will really become a mainstream or not, the concept is very interesting, so it's worth learning. And uh, the bottom line is that actually this Bitcoin, if nothing else, provides privacy and security for citizens, which really fits very nicely into this institution. So regardless of what else you will do beyond this presentation, I think that it will be really very good. And finally, these Bitcoins in its concept, current implementation deployments has some weaknesses, some problems, some opportunities for extensions. So I'm personally working on different kinds of these extensions as some uh, research and development activities with some members of my team, some in Stockholm, some here, where is Janis, <laughs> and, um, and uh, in US. So I would like to suggest actually some activities that I think would be useful for extending these Bitcoins and so on. And then finally, whether Bitcoin or not, but many people are saying that these principles and this concept could be also useful, maybe not really for payment or maybe for payment, but eventually also as an infrastructure for privacy enabled and anonymous transactions, which are really very complicated, but of high interest. So it's good for all of us to know really the principles. So maybe we can apply them to some payments straightforward, or maybe we can apply that as a concept to some other kind of uh, privacy enhanced to anonymous transactions. <clears throat> As a comment to the presentation, I would say the following. Uh, the Bitcoin is performing certain functions and when you talk about these individual functions and you interpret them intuitively, then they look in some way, but uh, through the concept they are really accomplished completely differently. 
So I will take in my presentation the following approach. I will, for individual functions, I will put forward a first intuitive approach that looks like normal and reasonable to accomplish the function. But in almost most of them, this is not exactly how the system works. And as I progress through my slides, then I will converge to the, how the system really works and what it really does. And finally, I would say in the middle of the presentation at any point, I am flexible with time. So basically, we can stop, ask questions, express opinions, so we can organize this, maybe at the end of the presentation, whatever, with some kind of discussion as well. So with this, my uh, structure is, I will first spend some time here uh, to explain to you exactly the concept how Bitcoin system works and what is the concept, what are components and so on. Then out of that concept I will review to you what is available today, what you can use and what are really the issues and some of the issues behind the curtain as we are here a strategic institute so we should know really what's behind the curtain. Based on all of that I will suggest two types of infrastructures or extensions these are more or less uh, results of my personal R&D with my team. One is functional infrastructure to accomplish the functionality of the system, and then security infrastructure, and then finally some couple of slides on some new innovative ideas. So we start now with the concept. Bitcoin in its simplicity is the system for payments. So I have some money, and then I pay to you. That's simply what the Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a payment system. I pay to you. So if you take that, then in fact we can interpret this Bitcoin through a number of its very important characteristics, which uh, are specific for Bitcoin or make it distinctive from any other system. And these characteristics are very important then for concept and deployments and extensions and everything else. So important characteristics of this system are the following. It's a payment system, so I have currency paid to you. Simple as that. It is actually peer-to-peer -peer system, so I pay directly to you. You can be individual, you can be a web merchant, you can be whatever, but the system is transaction between me and you. In particular, and very explicitly, there are no third parties involved. There is no some authority, Beyond two of us and bilateral relationship, there is no authority like a bank or clearing house or whatever else. In the concept of the system, in the current implementation, there are some third parties that assist parties in their transaction, but conceptually there are no third parties, which puts a very particular flavor or profile in the system. The system is completely digital. That means software, currencies, Everything else, there is no equivalent in the real world. All these uh, symbols of some coins and notes, etc., these are all really for kind of advertising purposes, but essentially the system is completely digital. Money is handled completely digitally through different digital resources. It is based on virtual currency, and we will explain exactly what this virtual currency means, but your 100 euros in the bank and you accessing these 100 euros through your browser is not a virtual currency, it's a digital form of the real currency. But the values, currencies themselves, etc., are all created, handled, moved, used, etc., as a virtual currency. That's also very important. Transactions are anonymous and also irreversible. So it means when I pay to you, I cannot reverse the transaction, which uh, generally merchants like very much because of all these chargebacks, etc. Interesting that transactions either have very low and no fees, and I will explain to you how the fees are determined and what these fees are. Uh, very advantageous, if you like, whoever you are, or very troublesome is that uh, the system doesn't have any legal regulations. So central bank, authorities, <coughs> Ministry of Finance cannot impose anything, and the system is rolling beyond their control, which could be good, but could be a trouble, so we will address this issue. And then finally, I said here the system can be used also as an infrastructure for other types of transactions. So with this, 
we should now focus to the a few of these first characteristics that this is a payment system that's direct peer to peer I pay to you there are no third parties it's completely digital and using virtual currency if you take that and you say okay how this really looks like and how it goes then it goes like there are two users and one user is paying to the other <coughs> these two users usually when you explain the relationship or protocol between two users in any other situation you usually say user A and user B but I have denoted here user 2 and user 3 which some kind of intentionally implies that there is also user 1 and there is a sequence so let's uh, stay with the user 2 and user 3 and the example here is that user 2 has a digitally completely digital file has 25 bitcoins and transfers these 25 bitcoins to user 3 so if you take example of email of the similar kind then basically I have a from field in the header of the email to you subject is 25 bitcoins and the date and then I send this email to you so basically email if we forget all these intermediate servers how the mail is transferred but I create this email with all these individual fields that look like this and then I send that to you and you receive this email and you have the email so this looks equivalent here I am sender this is recipient this is amount and this is the date and then I create this message and send to you this is how payment transaction between two parties looks very natural sender sends transaction of this amount to this time to the recipient and this is kind of the natural view payment between peer and peer everything is digital there is a software called Bitcoin wallet you have some bitcoins in your file you transfer to the recipient and as I said in the introduction this is not how the system really works we will see how the system really works but let's continue with this transaction since everything is digital in order this step to be a payment transaction valid payment transaction then there are two problems that recipient is concerned with and must solve the first problem is basically the recipient is concerned whether the sender really has these 25 bitcoin coins to send because it's a digital so you can create it yourself type file you got 25 bitcoins this is called proof of possession so I'm receiving some message from you 25 bitcoins but do you really own these 25 bitcoins did you make it yourself that's my first question my second question okay you do own 25 bitcoins and you are paying to me but I don't know whether you paid uh, earlier to someone else so you use it by the way this is uh, all digital so you can imagine that as me sending you an attachment I have a document I send attachment to you you receive attachment but I still have attachment so basically this is called double spending so I have to solve two problems of concern for the recipient are you authorized and do you have really these 25 bitcoins in your possession or this is fake and second double spending did you use this before and now just to mention one of the lines here that there are no third parties involved so basically when you take these two problems and you take a bank then these two problems don't exist they are peanuts why because the bank takes care of both of them with the bank you have your account and you are saying to the bank I am paying to this gentleman and the bank checks your account and you do have 25 bitcoins or euros and the bank transfers and the bank when you then transfer here and you try to transfer here the bank will say no you cannot do that so you see already the challenge of the Bitcoin this guy doesn't trust this guy but there is no nobody else it's only you and me so I need a proof from you that you are honest 
and you didn't double spend. Trust in this situation doesn't work. And there is no third party. So there is no bank, there is no Visa, MasterCard, there is nothing, there's just two of us. And everything is digital. So the question first is how I solve these two problems. As I said in the introduction, the concept of the system solves these two problems very efficiently and uh, in a very interesting way. So let's first start with this problem. Do you have 25 bitcoins to pay to me? So that this is a valid transaction. Bitcoin solves that in the following way. Bitcoin says, concept, that this recipient says to himself, you do have 25 bitcoins. If there is a transaction in time before my transaction here, where you are recipient. So if there is a transaction sent to you of 25 bitcoins, then you obviously own it and you have it. So in this sequence, there is a user one. So user three says, you do have 25 bitcoins. If there is a transaction in time before my transaction, where you receive 25 bitcoins, and then from that transaction you send to me. So therefore, user three says, is there an incoming transaction where you, my sender, where you are recipient? So user two says, is there a transaction from some user where you are recipient of 25 bitcoins? Time should be before my transaction. That's how Bitcoin solves the issue of this whether you do have 25 bitcoins, yes you do, if there is a transaction before my of 25 bitcoins. So therefore now... 25 for more. Oh, I'm coming to that, yes, exactly. There are much more problems than that, but uh, let's go through one step at a time. So, so far, okay, all right, if there is a transaction, right. However, as we just had a comment, there is no transaction of 25 bitcoins. No, because there are many transactions to you. Someone sent you 20 Bitcoin. So therefore, I must correct myself a statement from the previous slide. You do have 25 Bitcoins. If I can reconcile your account and see that you have received more than 25 Bitcoin. For this user, these transactions are called incoming transactions. So therefore, not exactly that you do have 25 if there is a transaction of 25, but if all the transactions add up to 25 or more. But conclusion so far is that this gentleman, he must know all incoming transactions to the center. However, as you can make a simple conclusion, this is really not sufficient because you may have all these incoming transactions, but basically you must have spent the, some of them more to some other users and you still have 25 bitcoins. So therefore, conclusion, I need this transaction where you pay to me and I need from, from you all the transactions that you received and you paid. So I will be able to reconcile your account at the time of my transaction. All the transactions that you receive and all the transactions that you pay out are actually kept in some kind of the digital form of the book. And the book that keeps financial transactions is called the ledger. So conclusion, I need your transaction to, that you are paying me, but sir, please send me also your personal ledger. 
send me the, your personal ledger so that I can see all the transactions that you received, I can see all the transactions that you paid, and then I can make my conclusion, do you have 25 bitcoins or not? So therefore, this user must send all the transactions, the full personal ledger, and this transaction to the recipient. The question, am I now happy? The answer is no. And second, so in fact, am I saying that the sender is sending one plus 300 other transactions over here? The answer is no. But conceptually, this kind of looks natural. Why this is no good? Because for five minutes here, I'm solving the problem of proof of possession. And now, you are okay with me if your incoming transactions are okay. But the proof of possession has shifted now to these guys who sent to you. You do send me your ledger. And I see transactions coming from this guy, that guy, this lady, that lady to you. But it has just shifted one step back. So now, not only that I have proof of possession of you as my direct payer, but I'm concerned with the proof of possession of all of them. So now, my conclusion is, and how this system works really is, not only that I need uh, your personal ledger, but I need the personal ledger of all these people who sent to you. So I need personal ledgers of all of them. So Mr. Sender, please send me personal ledgers that you received from these guys when they were paying you this transaction. So send me all these personal ledgers over here so that I can check now these guys here. And now you understand the issue. Now, <laughs> this can go back forever. So, you send me your personal ledger of all incoming and outgoing transactions. Of <laughs> so now there are two questions. Where this sequence really stops? Because it's recursive. And second, for me here, where this volume stops. I have to get personal ledgers now of 20 people and beyond these 20 here of another 20 people. So I have to get the personal ledger of everybody who ever worked with you. And where is this sequence stops? So let's solve first the problem where the sequence stops. Well, very simple, without knowing anything about Bitcoin, you can, you can pay me 25 Bitcoins if you receive 25 Bitcoins. And to simplify, let's say that the line goes on 25 Bitcoins. There is a purpose why we're using 25 Bitcoins. I'll come to that later. That there is a previous and previous and previous. And finally, I must stop somewhere. I must talk to some user that didn't receive any 25 Bitcoins from anybody before. In the standard concept, if you have heard about Bitcoin, these kind of users are called miners. I call them accountants for the reason, I will tell you why. So, just conceptually speaking, this sequence of going backwards must stop somewhere and there must be a person who didn't receive 25 bitcoins, but for this user, these 25 bitcoins popped up out of the blue air. Today, Bitcoin is worth, globally speaking, about $500. Real money. So these 25 Bitcoins is worth $15,000. So how can you pop up suddenly $15,000 in your pocket? Can I do that? Very lucrative. Out of nowhere, for nothing, I get $15,000. So obviously, there is some trick. But let's stop here. Conclusion so far is that this cannot go forever. There must be some user where this sequence of from me to you, from me to you, etc. stops. 
And some user that popped up 25 bitcoins out of the blue air. But as we know, nothing is free in the life. So we will see how these 25 bitcoins are generated and how they are assigned to this person. So we will stop the sequence right now. And we go to another problem. And that is a problem of this double spending. So earlier I said that this user says, send me all your outgoing transactions. So I will check that you didn't pay 25 before or portion of it. So I will check basically your outgoing transactions. But now if we summarize so far, inform me, inform me about your transaction. Inform me about all outgoing transactions. And inform me about the whole, the rest of the world of the incoming and outgoing transactions. So basically, I need a ledger of all transactions that ever happened in the system. Every transaction must be in the ledger. And so therefore, now speaking precisely, this guy paying to this guy is yet another transaction. And it's not only important that this guy is informed, but everybody else should be informed. Because this transaction must be entered into the public ledger. So therefore, this guy is saying, I will not send to you, like my example of email. I will actually send this transaction into the public ledger. And you will receive it through the public ledger as everybody else. So therefore, I am not paying to you and sending transaction of payment to you. I am informing the world. Hello world. Let me inform you that I am transferring 25 bitcoins to this gentleman. And I inform the world. And how I do that? For that purpose, there is something called Bitcoin Network. It's a strange beast. It's out there. Bitcoin Network. It is distributed network. It is fully integrated network. It uses broadcast protocol. It is not TCP IP protocol, very strange, and there are any networks that are not TCP IP. It has a delays in its operations, and it also has a control function. So let's uh, take one item at a time about this network. This network comprises a number of servers. Servers, like any other network. Distributed, so there are many servers, many servers. Fully integrated, it means whatever message comes to this server, it will distribute to all other servers. So all other servers receive all information that's fully integrated. When the information received, then this information is broadcast to all participants in the system. Broadcast. It's not using TCP IP protocol, it's actually called Internet Radio Chat Protocol, so that's a special protocol, and the network is using that protocol, and uh, it has certain delays and exercises, certain control. I'll leave these two issues for later. So now, I am not sending information to you that I am paying you 25 bitcoins at this moment in time. No, I am actually sending that into the network. I connect my wallet to the nearest node of the network and I send to the network. I'm not sending to you at all. I am sending to the network. I am paying to this person 25 bitcoins. And this transaction will be entered into the network. And through the broadcast, this person will receive it. He will be happy. And everybody else will receive it. So therefore, they can do all of these incoming, outgoing, etc. verifications. So basically, the network collects individual payments, transactions, and broadcasts them in the form of the not personal 
ledger, but in the form of so-called public ledger. Public ledger contains all transactions that ever happened in the Bitcoin system. And this public ledger is distributed through the broadcast protocol to all participants in the system. So now, as I explained, when I pay to you, I don't send this to you, I send to the network and then you receive this transaction that you have been paid back through the network. Is that how this really works? That you are informed about my transaction like this, I send transaction up, you receive it down? The answer is no. Here is how it works. In addition to these servers in the network, there are servers associated outside of the network, and here is how the network works. I send 25 bitcoin, bitcoins to you right now. But someone else in Japan sends his own friend 25 bitcoins a second later, also submitted into the network. And in Brazil, and the transactions are popping up, being all submitted into the network. The network, it's intelligent, collects these transactions for 10 minutes. 10 minutes received transactions. They are all called unverified transactions because I could make the transaction myself. So basically the network collects these transactions in the block, one after the other, for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, there are servers that are called pool servers. I will explain a little bit later the name, but just take this example. They are outside of the network, also connected to the network. And the network, at the end of 10 minutes, dumps all these transactions that happened all around the world. In these 10 minutes, the network dumps to the pool server. There are hundred thousands of these servers around the network today. They all receive a block of most recent transactions that happened in the last 10 minutes. And these guys who really have 25 bit crowns but didn't receive, they have a corresponding software which is called pool client and they receive into this pool client the block. And there are hundreds of thousands of these. So at the end of 10 minutes, the full block of transactions comes to these people to validate transactions. And now, let's see how this validation looks like. Very interesting concept. Sorry. Yes. Can you go back? Go back. One, yes. step, one second. Yes. Because it is not clear to me yes. whether it is 10 minutes. Yes. And it collects all the transactions made in, the, in this 10 minutes. Yes. And then it is transferred to this pool server. But to said, all pool servers. Yes. But you said there are many, many of them. All pool servers receive yeah. all the transactions in the last 10 minutes. The same. The same. The same 10. They all receive the same The same file. transactions. The same file. Block. And every single every, accountant yes, receives receive the same ten block. block. Okay. Okay. Hundred thousands of them and one million of these. Okay. And they receive that for the purpose of validating these transactions. They must validate transactions that happened in the last ten minutes. But why do they send the same information to a million different people? Uh, for two reasons. One reason is computationally intensive, so you cannot do it yourself, number one. And number two, there is a reward of this 25 Bitcoin, so whoever wants to. You want to do this, you have to get the software, connect yourself, do the work. All right? So now let's see how this validation works. Ah, just question? It's not a question, a minor remark. Yes. It doesn't have to be the same in the process. It's The, the question is, sometimes it's not, but that's not the problem. It's a, it's a valid question, but it's not the same. Uh, very good, very good comment. As I said earlier, the network has delay, so therefore of these uh, delays, there are 
small differences because one server received all of them and the other still didn't. It's a matter of milliseconds. So the comment is really correct at the level of expertise, but we are right now talking globally how this works. All right. Okay. So now let's see a little bit how this validation works. Validation is a very simple process to understand. For simplicity, there is a header of the block, which I will interpret in a minute. So simply there are all transactions here. And there is a data field here, which is left blank from the pool server that was received here by this account. And then what this validation includes is the following. You generate a random number of 32 bits, any number, and therefore you complete these transaction plus this randomly generated number and then this is publicly known so-called hashing algorithm and you push that through the hashing algorithm and you get a hash hash it's a digest of the block and here comes also one of the major differences of the Bitcoin with respect to any other security systems if you take email I also do hashing for you and when I create the hash, I package it to you, send to you, and basically you verify this hash. So kind of to say, in the email system, any hash is good. And it's very simple to produce because it's a one-way function, and you just take the block, create the hash. But in the Bitcoin system, not any hash is good. Hash has a special requirement. It must have certain number of leading bits equal to zero. And this is what the network informs all these accountants in the field called target. So the network says, I need for this block hash that has, as an example, that has one, two, three, four, five, six leading bits to be zero. Now, all of you who know this cryptography and hashing, you know that this hashing from any hash, which is simple, easy, and fraction of the second, with this requirement turn into impossible task. Because you have to hit the hash that has certain number of six here as an example, leading zeros. Then you put a random number here, and you calculate the hash and there is no good. Then you generate another random number and calculate the hash. And so you loop. You loop random number, calculate, random number, calculate, random number, calculate. The only way to do it, because the hash SHA-256 is non-invertible, the only way is randomly and by pure luck. You cannot predict what this number here is, so together, totality, it will give you the desired hash. You just keep rolling. And so you roll and roll and roll, and in one moment, you are lucky. You have a number here that produces hash that has one, two, three, four, five, six leading zeros. And therefore, since this here must be six in this example, and here the target has this one on the sixth position, then basically the hash is in its binary value, the hash is less than the target. Question? So do we understand correctly that the target is set different in every block validation? Uh, uh, not exactly. I will, uh, I will come to that, but let me just give a partial reply to that. And who, and if the, that yes. is the case, who is setting the target and why? Bitcoin, Bitcoin network is setting the target. With the Bitcoin network, I had the line that this also performs control, all right? And one of the controls is setting the target. So the Bitcoin network sets the target. Now you say, wait a minute, how and is this target? two zeros, or three zeros, or five zeros, so how many zeros is the target? But let's leave that for 10 minutes from now, we will come to this issue. But, in fact, here, we already have one value in the header. By the way, this is conceptual, the header is very complicated, whatever, but the network sends these transactions and says to this guy, generate 
hash which is less than the target that the network sent. Question. Each uh, pool client receives a different target value. No, no, no. For the, the same, same target. The same is a global variable in the network. Okay. So you can ask, uh, excuse me, what is a current target? There is the current target for the whole world. Okay. And I will come to point how this target is determined. But for the time being, when I say to you as cryptography experts that not random hash is good, but the hash must have a certain number of leading zeros, you know, to, oh my God, that's impossible. It's a pure luck. But you keep looping here. Let's move on. But why zeros? Uh, why just do you say, is it real zeros? Real zeros. Or is it a free that no, no, no. No, 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 real, real zeros. But really the essence is that the hash that is valid must have a predetermined structure. So it could be any could be like any binary number. Could be like the following conceptually. It could be that the second, fifth, fourth, and fifteenth bit are zeros also. But this is easier because then I can say that the valid hash must be less than the target because it has a convenient binary form. But let's continue. So you have your PC. This is publicly available. You connect to the pool server. You can do it tomorrow, today. You will receive blocks. You push the button on this here, and you start, and you go for dinner. <laughs> and if you hit, you will get a reward. So out of all these hundred thousands or millions, when the first guy hits, well, he gets 25 bitcoins as a reward. So, please, do the mining, you will get, if you hit, you will get 25 bitcoins as a today value, 12.5 thousand dollars. That is how the new 25 currency units have been created. They have been created as a result of cryptographic computation. And everybody can do that. And 25 bitcoins pops up. And it's in the pool of all the bitcoins. Then you have now 25 bitcoins. And now we have solved our recursive sequence. So these accountants who received the block and work hard when one of them in the world hits, gets 25 bitcoins. When you have a hit, so you get this nice uh, block or random number really that fits here. When you hit, then you do the following. You actually complete the block. You put this random number that fits. You put the value. You put the date and time when your hit happened. And the target received back. And what you do here, this uh, field was kind of mysterious, is actually when you are completing this block, you also received the earlier for your calculations received a hash of the previous block from the previous 10 minutes. So you include this hash here, you do the calculation, when you have a hit, you determine date and time, and then you return that into the network. You return this completed block into the pool server, and pool server will return into the network pool server that you are associated with will inform the world, hey, 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 hello, 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 stop, stop mining, stop mining, the block has been resolved. So basically this block has actually hash of the previous block and while here we were doing these calculations, the network was accumulating another round of transactions. And so when there is a hit, then there is a valid hash. And basically the network takes this hash, puts at the top of the next block, puts a target, puts all the transactions, and sends this 
transactions now again for validation. When you get a hit, then the network generates 25 bitcoins, sends to the pool server, and pool server sends to your account. So, in fact, we can say that there is a transaction that doesn't have a sender. It's a transaction that generated 25 bitcoins out of the blue air and you are the recipient. But this transaction is a payment transaction as any other, but these kind of transactions that don't have previous sender, but they just pop out as the result of this mining, they are called Coinbase. So your payout from the server where you are the recipient is actually in this Coinbase transaction. So Coinbase transaction, initial payout from the previous block, all transactions that were accumulated in this block, and they are sent out again for the new round of calculations. When your transaction here, this is now this user here that was receiving this transaction. When your transaction is in the block that is now out and with the hash, then your transaction is called validated. So your transaction is validated. Now you are finally safe. You have 25 bitcoins finally. But not yet, because there are some tricky issues. So the transaction is validated. Just in passing, I will mention that uh, you received 25 bitcoins as a successful hit. But actually here you see there are multiple Coinbase transactions because the real system does not send 25 to one person. It sends to multiple persons. So how can multiple persons receive money when only one has a hit? I will explain that. But for completeness of discussion, there are multiple payouts for the hit plus transaction between other users packaged in the block and the block is now distributed again for the next 10 minutes. So therefore, I am not sending transaction, receiving transaction. I am as a sender sending transaction into the network. The network accumulates transactions into 10 minutes, sends out, the block is processed, the block is verified, and then returned to the network and the network distributes and broadcasts blocks as they are validated. But, as in the previous slide, in each block there is a hash of the previous block. And in this hash, hash and hash, so the blocks are organized into a linear sequence of blocks which is called blockchain. Blockchain. Blockchain is new block with all the transactions that happened in the previous 10 minutes at the top of the chain where this new block has the hash of the previous block and this goes all the way chaining into the blockchain. So blockchain contains from the very beginning all the way until right now today if we connect we will get the blockchain contains all the transactions that happened all the time in the lifetime of the Bitcoin system. And this is called public ledger. So Bitcoin network maintains and distributes public ledger. And public ledger in form of discrete blocks will be linked into the blockchain contains all the transactions. So finally, our story that I paid to you 25 Bitcoins, no. I inform the network and after 10 minutes you will get the blockchain and your transaction from me is in the blockchain and the blockchain has a hash, it's validated, so your transaction payment from me to you is validated. Can you now use these 25 Bitcoins, you are now finally okay? The answer is no. Why? Because of the following. There is a blockchain rolling all the time. So one very simple question is, excuse me, but what is the very first block? Because there must be a previous hash. So one of the mysteries is who really invented this system? 
But there is a mysterious name of the researcher who invented this system, which looks really the home system like a rocket science. So one researcher invented the system, but we will leave that for issues. So there was a first block generated that actually has a dummy block. Nothing really, just some kind of date and so on, and the hash. So this block is called Genesis block. And this block was used just to trigger the hash for the first block, and that's how the system started. And now, so far, we understand that actually this is the top of the chain, and there is a new block being worked on where your transaction is. And when there is a hit, this block will be linked to the previous block, will be submitted to the network, and you will receive it. And you will finally see in that block your transaction of 25 bitcoins. But there is an issue with this block being verified with the hash and you receive it. There is an issue. What is the issue? Because this, what I have here, this generation of this hash, is first non-deterministic. So this means that there are different type of random numbers that can give the target hash. So multiple possibilities. Number one. Number two. 100,000 people are doing that. So I have a hit. But uh, three milliseconds later, there is another hit somewhere else in China. And there is a block submitted. And the block is hooked to the top of the blockchain. So in fact, the situation is that the blockchain has branches. I have a hit. But the network has a delay until I load the block, to distribute. Hey, people, 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 please, 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 stop on this block. But until I get people stop on this block, I have produced, uh, I'm rolling my hashes. Who went lucky? I got the hit. Who? Uh, distribute. Someone else in Mexico received my block. Continued. Who oh, got the hit? Check. Append. So the blockchain actually is not linear. It branches. So the question is now, which of these is actually valid? I said here, I will explain how this target is created. But I said that the, that the network also controls the whole system. And one of the controls is the rule that you should append your new block when you get hit. You should append to the longest branch. That's the rule. And actually, these miners, software and the pool, they work in that way. This is one of the controls. When you get the hit, you should append to the longest branch. And by the way, just to mention in passing, how about that if all three branches are, are the same, so where do you append there? The rule is that you check the time when the block was created, when the hash. So out of the times, you should append to the earliest. And so therefore, conclusion indeed, that these branches will die out. And the main blockchain is progressing. So branches die out, and one goes. And then branch, and die out, and one, and so. So there are branches, and they die out following the network rules. Yes, but uh, what happens to those uh, those uh, other branches? That Lost. In principle, Lost. Are... Lost. If you are served with your transaction in this block and not in this block, you lose your transaction. Yes. Yes, you lose your transaction. You lose your money. So transaction not valid. Mm -hmm. Not valid. Hopefully. But in principle, this is a valid. Uh... In principle, it is. But there are certain small tricky issues that sometimes you lose. For instance, you have a hit. You have a hit. And you are a lucky guy. You get 25 bitcoins, $15,000. And as you submit, you are informed, sorry, the network received just three seconds before. So you have so-called hits dead on arrival. So there are certain small discrepancies only because the network is partially distributed and has delays. So now I can summarize that basically I send a transaction. All this happened that I just explained. 
public ledger is created, everybody receives the latest transactions, and the transactions are validated when my transaction is in the longest block. Today, the rule is after about six blocks, which is six blocks by 10 minutes, which is about one hour. So now, finally, I am okay with my 25 bitcoins after one hour. So there is a delay in validation. So therefore, we have covered now these five aspects. So we understand exactly how the transactions are generated, how they are distributed, how they are approved, how the virtual currency is created. But now we should pay attention to these three characteristics. But practically speaking, uh, there, are, there is a third party involved. Oh, there is course. someone who has to validate the transaction. Uh, basically, yes. There is a third party, there is a network. It's not only because... No, it's not the, yes. There is a network and the mechanism and, there is and a the pool accountants server. and the... Yes. Yes. Which in yes. the end uh, effectively is a third party. So, so yes. You are right. a bank. You are right. Is the my bank. Basically, it all depends on the community because this, uh, uh, this uh, accountants are the members of the community. So there is no authority, but there is a third party. You did mention really, or maybe you didn't notice, that I said so many times that if the transaction is performed in time before, so they leave the time server. You need a time server, right? Reliable time, and there is a time system in the internet. So in fact, saying popularly that this is really no third party, no, this is not true. That's not true. There are third parties, but they are not Visa and Bank to validate transactions, but there are parties to assist. Yes, you are right. So there are third parties. So now let's see how these transactions are really anonymous. Actually, my example was here that I am sending to you 25 bitcoins, and basically this is not anonymous because it's my identity, your identity. So, in fact, now you know that I'm submitting this into the network, not directly to you, so far so good. But basically, these two in the header, like email, no, they are not my identities. They're completely differently created. The system uses public key cryptography. You all know about public key cryptography. Every user has a pair of keys. Public key, private key. I send public key to my partner. And public key can then envelope to me some message, which in this case basically is to receive payments. So every user has a key pair in the Bitcoin system. When you want to send me the transaction, I send you my public key. Or you fetch it from the public repository. And then you use that public key to envelope payment to me. And I can open this payment with my private key, so when I want to use these 25 bitcoins to send to you, then basically I use my private key. What is really very interesting, we all know about public key cryptography for 20 years now, but the system is not using RSA. The system is using elliptic curve cryptography. So for those who are experts, this is how it goes. In elliptic curve, the advantage is against RSA is that with RSA, you must generate key pair, two keys, independently of each other. You generate one and the other one that fits certain conditions. But with the elliptic curve cryptography, you generate first private key as a random, and then you fit it into so-called elliptic curve, and you get a public key. So elliptic curve cryptography has an advantage of you can generate public key from the private key. These are real examples how the private key looks like, then you take public key, push into the curve, and you get public key. And by the way, conceptually, this public key is used actually for you to receive payments. But this public key is a little bit pre-processed here. And basically, you have a 32 printable string of bits, which is your Bitcoin address. Bitcoin address. Or in this presentation, we can call that also an account. So I generate key pair, and then I have a public key, which is my account. I send to you, please pay to this account some money. This comes encrypted, and then I can open it with my private key. So therefore, there is a little bit distinction between account 
and this address, but at the time here, we can say as it is. So basically, public key of the public key cryptographic system is my account, and my private key is the key to open this account. Since this account, in this form or this form, it doesn't matter, this account is basically meaningless. I send to you this account, so at least you know that you are paying to me, but in principle, this is really completely anonymous, so I'm saying I am paying to this account 25 bitcoins. Whoever has a corresponding private key can open and can manipulate with this currency. So what goes onto the public key ledger? is the hash yes. of the private key, yes. so you can't even, without a great deal of work, find out who that public key is. Exactly, yes, yes. There, there is a level of protection at the level of cryptography that you just explained, and then there are some very extreme expert analysis of different kinds of keys, etc., but in principle, for general public, we can say that anonymous transactions are accomplished by me distributing my public key, you don't know anything who is this or whatever, but in principle you send this money and then I recover the money. Except it's anonymous against a one-to-many inquiry, yes. but not against a one-to-one -one Exactly, yeah, you're right, because you have to know that you're paying to me. All right. So therefore, this is basically how this anonymity works. All this together is automated in some whatever current systems. So basically now we can do a summary here. For consumers it's anonymous. We will see there are not so many fees because it's everything is digital. So micropayments are really convenient. And basically this is worldwide because you can pay to any country. There is no relationship to any currency. By the way, just to mention in passing for you for these micropayments, one Bitcoin today on the market, we will mention that too, costs about $500. So it's really very inconvenient to do this $500 as a unit. But the, in the system, Bitcoin is actually managed at the level of eight decimal digits. So you can pay micro amount of euro cent. So it's kind of convenient for micropayments. For merchants, when once you wrap with the public key, you cannot reverse, it's gone. Only the targeted recipient. So merchants, they like it because they are killed by this reverse transaction complaint. So merchants like it. Very low fees because it's all digital. And then basically the infrastructure is simple because you can establish yourself the system very easily. You don't have to subscribe to Visa, Bank, and all that together. So the system in the background really works really very complicated, but perception and the instrument, etc., is really uh, very easy. However, there are many here that are very concerned because it's a competition to Visa if it catches up. No regulation, so I can send to anybody porn drugs, whatever, and there is no control. So these are the characteristics of, of the system. So now, basically, here is the sequence. Step one, I generate key pair. And by the way, I can generate new key pair for every transaction. You want to pay me, I generate key pair, send you public key. Then you want to pay me, I generate again key pair. So I have many accounts. One pair of transaction, if I want, or I can reuse. Very good. I send my public key to the sender. Sender opens his wallet with the private key, creates transaction enveloped with the public key. Transaction is passed in the block to be validated, validated, returned back, reward comes back. Here the block comes basically after six iterations the transaction is validated and you can then use this money to pay further. So now, yes? So I, I thought it was uh, one of the advantages was that it's a quick payment system, but as a merchant you have to wait for one hour to be sure. One hour, that that's right. That's so right. every time you sell a product you have to... Wait one hour. One hour? Yes. Six blocks. Six blocks. Why six blocks? So this is a convention that you are absolutely certain that you are not in the branch of the block that will die. Mm -hmm. By the way, 
One hour. You know what is the cycle with the banks and the bank cards? If I buy something online, if yes. I buy a flight, the, yes. the time I click, yes. the transaction is like, the are, transfer I don't know, but the ticket... If you are is, Amazon, you will get your money tomorrow with Visa. Here, in one hour. All right, but... but all right. All right. Uh, so what I want to say, the, the payment is done the day after, but the transaction is validated instantaneously. When I purchase something, the merchant sent me the ticket, and I'm fine. You are talking with the with the point of the, with the from the perspective of the consumer. Yes. The no, merchant. from the perspective of a merchant. Merchant receives real money to his account tomorrow. All right, and the consumer receives the product instantaneously. Yes. Okay. It, this is not possible in this system because the consumer receives the product after one hour when the merchant is sure he is going to receive the money. Uh, yeah, you are you know, right about so, that, yes, yes. So this, right. is the method this is the value of, of having a, yes. a financial intermediation, intermediator yes. who validates the transaction. This is now the matter of this yeah. European policy. I think he's talking about real shops, uh, brick and mortar shops, which, yes, you have to make the, the, the shop, you have to the purchase, go get a coffee, come back after an hour and get your product. With Bitcoin, there are other chains. All right. Next question. Next just, comment. Just, do we have experience up to now what the probability is, which is presumably steadily decreasing over the hour, or at least decreasing in 10 minute steps, All right. that a transaction will be rejected? Because as a merchant, I might, since it's clearly not under control of my customer, yes, 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 as a merchant, yes. I might reasonably say, if I am 99.3% secure that this transaction will go ahead, you can have it. Yes, you're right. Yes. That's probably yes. less than the yes. cost I take, the risk I take. I'm not either. aware of this kind of experiments and these merchant policies. <laughs> right. but, uh, I thought I understood, but uh, now it seems that I'm not understood. Okay. There's uh, that branches. All right. Because th these uh, transactions that are in one of those bad branches yes. uh, actually will never be validated and the merchant will never receive its money. That's right. So effectively, yes. the transaction did not happen. There may be transactions that you trigger, but they don't appear finally as valid. But yes. if it happens every 10 minutes, then there must be a lot of transactions out there that, never, that are never yes. valid. Yes, no, they're not lost. You oh, the transactions are not lost. They're resubmitted in the next block. In the okay. next block, that's oh, right. Okay. Yes. Okay. By the way, so those branches that are broken, in fact, you refeed yeah, into the mainstream. Into the next block, yeah. okay. If you think carefully right. that because of this synchronization problem, most of the transactions within the 10 minutes will be in all blocks. But some at the end that are submitted right because the block is gone. All right? And so this is, and basically this is the comment of a revalidation in the next round. Yes. What if all the minors are sleeping? There is no read. And we can discuss what are the issues. There are more issues than that. Yes, we can. Let's let's progress with the concept of the system. Yes, I, think, uh, I missed some point. Uh, yes. The proof of uh, possession. Yes, when, when actually is happening? In what step? With proof of possession. At the uh, client, through client, or on the uh, yeah. uh, at the recipient when you receive the block. Okay. Then, then I can reconcile from the complete blockchain. I can reconcile your account and see that you're okay. There are no transactions so on user three. On user three, that's right. So now let's cover a little bit. I covered my item here of anonymous and irreversible transaction. Let's cover a little bit regulations and policy. The only regulations are the rules how the network operates. The network operates under the following rules. In the first four years, the system was started in 2009 with the Genesis block, 2009. The rules are the following. This 25 that I'm using since the beginning is the reward today. But the reward system is the following. In the first four years, a reward for a hit was 50 bitcoins. After four years, we are now in this period, is 25 bitcoins. Next four years is 2.5 bitcoins. So the reward is every four years is reducing. Finally, as you understand, there will be no reward. So you are by this number here and calculate by four years. In 240, there will be total 21 million bitcoins. So that's total number of bitcoins that will be generated. 
New block every 10 minutes. Here we come now to this network takes the timing. A network doesn't want the blocks to be generated too fast and doesn't want the blocks to be generated too slow. So the network takes average time of a couple of blocks and keeps statistics. But we have a couple of slides because of this process is actually speeding up. The network is constantly increasing so-called difficulty. So it meets computational capabilities of current hardware devices that are used to generate hashes. So the network keeps on average 10 minutes. So suddenly <coughs> blocks are coming sooner, the network puts one more zero in the target. And it doubles the complexity. That is how the target is created. So that computational power of all these miners here in the corner all together generate bitcoins in uh, average 10 minutes. That is how the targets are. And network mysterious structure controls that. Full verification after six blocks, we already discussed that because of some dying out, etc. Anonymous identities, we covered that. Transactions irreversible. Fees determine verification policy and priority. When you pay out, myself, I'm paying to you, I declare right now, I declare what fee I want to pay. And if I say zero, then basically there will be no fees. You will receive exact amount. But then the policy of the network is to put this no fees transaction at the lower priority if there are some delays and so on. So because of this here, Currently, there are two rewards for these accountants or miners. One reward is hit, but this is decreasing. And one reward is then collecting fee. And so basically, the more the time goes, the fee is, will be the reward for these accountants. That's why I call them accountants rather than miners. And then I already mentioned that the longest blockchain is valid. And so with that, we have now covered also these three aspects of regulations and so on. And then there is a security platform and so on. I will mention that. So with that, let me move on to my next topic. And that is what exists today. So you like all of the above. So what exists today, let's start. What exists today is the network. The network is operational. There are some numbers, IP numbers, URLs, okay, publicly known. You can connect. There is a software, Bitcoin Wallet, which is currently in beta and that's in open source. You can download it and start using it. There is a, a software, open source, for these pool servers that I mentioned, that receive these blocks and distribute to all these accountants. So you can download it, install it, run yourself a pool server. There are several of these mining clients or pool clients, also open source. And basically there are some additional servers that are really connected to the Bitcoin network. So some of them are up, some of them are down, but you can get the complete blockchain, you can get the value of the Bitcoin and so on. So these are resources that you can download. You have nothing to do with this network. So basically you, ca you can download wallet, you can run a pool server and you can do mining software all publicly available. Here is just the flash for you of the original Bitcoin wallet. When you connect it, you see it says here, four hours behind. It means actually that it's downloading a blockchain. And basically needs some time to download blockchain. When it downloads blockchain, you are fully synchronized, and basically then you can send and receive payments. So that's an open source that you can use. It's uh, not functional on all platforms. It's vulnerable to viruses and malware. We were running this, uh, and while we were synchronizing, several viruses appeared from whoever knows where. So everybody knows the port of the wallet, so everybody is hitting into that. Basically, there are open network attacks because all ports are known, and basically this is buggy, so if you crash here, and if you somehow lose your <coughs> private key, you lose bitcoins forever. So bitcoins are lost forever. Here is the current experience.
impact, crashed, all kind of things. So basically, everybody is saying that this is still really experimental, and what you really need is actually some consistency, reliability, better testing, etc., some kind of professional activities. But basically here, a couple of these uh, outsourced wallets were crashing. This basically Insta wallet was shut down. There is a famous exchange which was actually crashed, etc. So uh, from our experience, I would tell you that basically all this is very unreliable, so still in the experimental phase. Let's discuss one very interesting issue actually about this mining. So I said to you that there is a hashing function. You can download software or download this hashing. And as we all know, actually, let's give a couple of numbers here to see how it goes. We are using this uh, Intel chip, which has 3 gigahertz approximately. Does that a matter of the example? And if I take that one hash, one hash, all the sequence, just for the sake of aligning here the numbers, that it actually takes one million instructions. One million instructions to calculate one hash. Then basically, with this chip, I am trying 3,000 hashes per second. 3,000 hashes per second. So in the second, I try 3,000 random numbers. 3,000 in a second. Just to keep running. So basically, looks really very good. Load software, push the button, go. Should you do it? The answer is no. You don't have a chance. Number one, your CPU will burn. Number two, with this 3,000 hashes per second, absolutely no chance. Why? Because some people were really wise, so don't use that. Some people are using GPU. This is a graphics processing card. You know the chip that we are using for playing games. For the sake of demonstration, don't take this seriously, that this is 1,000 times faster. So GPU chip is 3,000 gigahertz. So therefore, I am actually calculating 3 million hashes per second. 3 million hashes when I tick. I have tried 3 million. What are my chances to get some money? The answer is, don't even think of it. <laughs> because there are special chips. As we all know, IT people, these are so-called general purpose chips. We know that they load software and execute. But there are ASIC chips, application-specific uh, chips, integrated circuit chips. They have a logic hardwired into the chip. And there are Bitcoin hash chips hardwired. For the sake of the discussion, they have 1,000 times higher speed than this CPU. So they have 3 giga hashes per second. Those chips we should use. Question? What's the current number of zeros? Current number of zeros where? In the in the target? Yes. In the target. I think it's about eight zeros up front. Is that right? Yes. I don't remember. Yeah, but about eight zeros. Eight zeros. That yes. seems extraordinarily few. Then one one in two hundred and fifty six will hit. Eight zeros, right? But approximately. But hit hash of eight leading zeros is extremely complicated. Let me continue the number of hashes to see when we will get the hit. So now I am saying this was actually 3,000 hashes per second. Forget it. 3 million hashes per second. Forget it. Use ASIC chip. What is that? 3 giga hashes. How you call it? 3 billion hashes per second. Use this chip. No. No chance. Always someone else in the world has a hit before you. Don't even try. Use a box, you see, boards. Each board has 12 of these chips. Board. 12. Click, 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 12. And 12 boards. And you don't see there is a ventilator. 
and this is three tera hashes per second. If you use this, so it's mind blowing. If you use this, this costs three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars, and uh, it uses uh, hundred dollars a month of electricity. So therefore, it generates about hundred. I will say how you get hundred. Suddenly, out of these twenty-five bitcoins that are worth twelve point five thousand, but I will come to that. So it generates about hundred dollars. You will never make your investment. So don't use that. What are people using today? It's a storage for aircraft full of shelves. They calculate three peta hashes per second. And you have a chance. You can generate about five million dollars a month with this whole thing. Use more than a power plant. In passing, what is really very interesting is the following. In passing, software, which is open source. Probably you all have experience with open source, right? So you take open source, download, put uh, whatever, Microsoft Studio, right? How this goes. Compile and run. For the wallet. I spent in the lab, myself and two experts for C, C++ and so on, three months just to compile wallet, just to compile. Manual, how to compile this step and this bug and this problem is 55 pages just to compile. So now you tell me, is this software doing only Bitcoin payment? Number one. Number two, Intel, decent company in California, NVIDIA, forget. Chips, all in China. All produced in China. Are these chips doing really Bitcoin hashing? But we don't even think. All in China. Wait a minute. There's something strange here. So now you have a chance. But even with this farm, you are not doing this yourself. You basically join the pool of 100,000 other people. And we are all together in this pool doing this, what I explained. And when one member of the pool has a hit, then we all split. These 25 bitcoins, you get couple, 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 depending on the, how long you have been mining. There are different policies, but you understand all of that. And here is the status of these pools. Out of the total computational power, all these chips today in the Bitcoin network, this slice here, percentage, what is that? You know yourself, 20% something. This slice is operated by the company which is registered at the British Indian Ocean Territory. British Indian Ocean Territory. The next largest pool is Discus Fish, which is registered in China. The next pool is registered in Panama, it's one of which has dummy address. Who is running these pools? So you go to this web, <laughs> nothing. Very strange. This is the structure. And they are all vulnerable. So this is the situation with the current system. Chips from China, farms in Panama, pools in Indian Ocean territories. So this is the situation. You make your own conclusions. I mentioned these farms here and these chips, and they do these terahashes of computations. Listen. 
total chip power for Bitcoin is 200 times more powerful than all supercomputers today in the world. Total computing power of these chips is 200 times more powerful than any supercomputer. I'm leaving this topic to all of us to say what exactly are they doing, number one, and number two, even worse, what exactly they can do. Our bank, that's actually what I'm talking to some US authorities, they all say our virtual currency will damage our dollar. I say, guys, 200,000 computing power. You can imagine what this can do in the wrong hands and with the back door. So that's the real issue, not uh, some couple of virtual currency dollars that are floating here and there for some selling drugs, not a problem. So this is the situation. So therefore, current issues and uh, situation. First, is it clear from the price history, Bitcoins are extremely volatile. Second, it is still uncertain whether Bitcoins, which are simply a string of numbers that have one acceptance as payment method for some online transaction, will grow into something approaching a mainstream currency. And third, if hackers rob the network Bitcoin exchange, they might be also pull a similar haste in the virtual wallets of the funds, banks, governments, you name it. This was a respectful source just two days ago. Chips from China, pools in Panama, Cayman Islands, 200,000 more powerful. So what we should do, honest people, forget the whole thing, don't even get close. Oh, we cannot do that because this institution is very interested. This institution is very interested. The whole continent is very interested. So we got to do something. I don't know why. This is one of the purposes of this presentation, but I'm leaving this to you after the presentation. We cannot really just say, oh, just an experiment. So we have to pay attention to that. So basically, to summarize, there are problems with the concept. For instance, I'm thinking, uh, here was the question about the zeros. When this number of zeros grow, maybe that there is no random number that can hit, maybe computationally speaking, maybe. So the whole process is blocked. Second, there are only 21 million bitcoins. But you change computer, crash, loss, when you lose, you lose. So there will be not 21 million, you know, how many files you lose when you change computer. Hackers, etc. So basically crashes, hackers, etc. So the amount is uh, reducing. So there is a problem in the concept. Some people already noticed uh, this timing. So what I'm saying, my personal comment and opinion is, altogether seems like a good system, but needs a little bit of polishing, quality research and development. There are problems with current resources, bugs, viruses, hackers, and all that. Problems with current deployments, all in some crazy countries. And then there are also problems with security, as I already mentioned. So basically what I am doing with my team is we are working on the integrated functional infrastructure to connect all of that together at the push of the button and basically to enhance it with security. So very briefly. Sorry, sorry, may yes. I, may I all right. For a yes. Don't, don't take me wrong. No, this is discussion. There is no the right or wrong here. You can say that for any software that we will run on our machines. Definitely we have problems with the concept, with the resources. This is, uh, in a way, normal. That there are bugs, there are viruses every day, and problems with yes. security. Yes. So, yes. for me, there are other issues that, okay. uh, uh, that matter. For example, uh, the total number of Bitcoins yes. is finite. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I can, I will never have more than 21 million Bitcoins That's right. yes. in the world. Yes. yes. This is one. Yes limitation. Yes, you're right. So yes. the old system is not scalable. 
Yeah, you're so right. It will yes. never scale about yes. the way it is designed. Now. Exactly. Yes. It will never scale about yes. that amount. Yes. The 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 other point uh, I wanted to make and that, that I still do not understand what happens. What where is this money coming from? Where are the 21 million bitcoins that times uh, 500 dollars yes. per bitcoin yes. uh, at, yes. up to I don't know, yes. in, uh, yes. Yes. 11 billion dollars? Yes. Uh, yes. Where, yes. where are they coming? From? Yeah, they are. Coming and where are they going after yes. you Let's decide to use it? Let me tell you. Answer the question: Where? Why is it bitcoin 500 dollars? Where is this 500 coming from? Mm. It is coming from an open market. There are servers that are called exchanges. We have one, I will show you, GUI, that server. So you are, let's say, this uh, accountant. Let's say that you have 25 bitcoins. You can use them to pay to someone else, or you can put them on exchange. On exchange, exchange is auction. Auction. And bitcoins are traded on auction for real money. Started with ten dollars per Bitcoin. Now it's growing in popularity. Reached one thousand dollar per Bitcoin. Now it's actually back after some crashes to four hundred fifty dollars. Open market auction. You pay five four fifty. This guy he needs uh, desperately Bitcoin for some reason, so he will pay more. You know. So it's like uh, it's like shares. Okay, it's a piece of paper until someone decides to give you five hundred dollars. Exactly. For a piece of paper. Exactly. Yes. I don't think, with respect, I don't think that's a problem with Bitcoin. Then is it with many other currencies? Yes. All currencies. Yes. Yes. But yes. Well, my, my sort of the question that occurs to me is the ASICs that we need to do a Bitcoin calculation. Search, yes. How close are those to the ASICs we need to brute force an elliptic curve key? Uh, equivalent. <laughs> equivalent. Because yes. if those farms, yes, if those farms are being used. To do bitcoins rather than to to, to break to break the keys, keys. Yes. that also yes. gives you some yes. notion of, yes. uh, or, of floor price or to decrypt triple death or AES encrypted password in the bank. Yes, absolutely, you're right. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Produced in China, are these uh, chips really doing only this hash? Whereas if they were produced in the USA. Oh, well. <laughs> or Europe. Or any decent environment and country. And that is where our European role comes. There are certain issues that can be used from the concept, but modify them a little bit. Volatile. Use volatile. You know, $300, $700. Nobody likes that. Nobody. So there are lots of very interesting functional, conceptual, operational and security issues. That's it. And that's the purpose of this overview so that I boost up a little bit of thinking. So, all right. So now, basically this functional infrastructure is the following. I mentioned already pool, which is add-on server to the network. There are many of them. There are some exchanges. Exchanges are classical. You upload your Bitcoins, people bid. It's like eBay. And then you get your bitcoins for your money. And that's where 400, 500, 3,000, whatever comes from. There are also some information servers, so you can get the status of the blockchain and the value and so on. So basically, this means that for functionality, you have to build a little bit functionality servers, whatever, around the bitcoin network for these users so they don't run all this buggy PC software. 